Reality Check Radio, in focus on the stories affecting New Zealanders. And today, we're talking about fluoride. Add life to your teeth with Minaka Fluoride. For most people, fluoride is a substance that we've all been brought up to believe is not just safe, but also essential for healthy teeth. To build a toothpaste, maximum fluoride. We see the ads for toothpaste and the smiles and the dentists in white coats, and we just believe. Fluoride means healthy. Fluoride means protection for our teeth. Fluoride means it's good for the whole family. You can't buy a better cavity fighter than AIM. It tastes great. She's right. So what better idea is there than to put it in New Zealand's drinking water? and make everybody's teeth healthy. Kia ora, good evening. The Director General of Health has told 14 local councils to start fluoridating their drinking water supplies. Today, I have written to 14 local authorities directing them to fluoridate their drinking water supply. Unfortunately, New Zealand has relatively high rates of preventable tooth decay. Fluoridation is well proven to be a safe, affordable and effective method of preventing tooth decay that benefits everybody, but particularly children. Māori, Pacifica, and our most vulnerable. It was a decision made possible by the Health Amendment Act of 2021, taking the decision to fluoridate away from local councils and giving it to the Director General of Health. And it would mean that those councils now could be ordered to add fluoride to their water without consulting their communities. And if they didn't, they could incur fines of up to $200,000 plus $10,000 for every day they delayed doing so. Why aren't you making all the councils fluoridate their water? Why just 14 at the state? We wrote to all councils who currently do not fluoridate their water. On the basis of the responses we had from the councils, we then triaged those for whom the cost could be accommodated within an envelope of around $11 million that we have available to support Capital Works. And so we've started off with those that first group of councils, but rest assured I have written to all of them and made it very clear to them that we will be following up with them. And so with that, 14 letters were sent out to 14 councils, each with a date by which the fluoridation had to occur, and each with the order that their water supplies must be dosed with 0.7 to 1 milligram per litre of fluoride. It will take the number of New Zealanders drinking fluoridated water up to 60%. And that's a number that would put New Zealand in a club of just eight other nations who fluoridate more than 50% of their drinking water supplies, including neighbours Australia, Singapore, Malaysia and Brunei in Southeast Asia, Chile in South America, the USA and Ireland in Europe. And to put that in context, only 2% of Europe actually fluoridates part of their water supplies. And instead, most countries there and around the world have actually rejected it altogether, which makes New Zealand's enthusiasm for it quite unique on the global stage. But I do want to emphasise the point. Uh, this is a safe, highly effective, highly cost-effective intervention and councils don't need to wait for a directive to get on and uh, protect their most vulnerable citizens from tooth decay. And with that, it was done. The message was clear. Don't wait, don't question, just do it. Fluoride is good for all of us. But there's also another group of people out there with a message that fluoride isn't good for us. And soon, all across New Zealand, local council meetings that are usually empty were being filled to capacity. Even ones like this one at the Bay of Plenty Regional Council, which is not one of the councils mandated, but still draws a crowd, hopeful that their opposition to fluoride is heard. And on this occasion, they're here in support of Jody Brunning, who's speaking on behalf of physicians and scientists for global responsibility, and in particular, on the subject of a new US government report that contains evidence that fluoride is actually injuring brains. My name is Jodie Brunning, I'm a sociologist with a research history that traverses human and environmental health. Around half of New Zealand's population drink fluoridated water and so we might presume that there would be a policy framework monitoring protocols and assessments of environmental risk. But this discussion today concerns the deficit of such measures. 
The Water Services Act's purpose is to ensure that drinking water suppliers provide safe water to consumers. And now that's an important point because we are exposed to fluoride in multiple ways. And a September 2022 US National Toxicology Program document has been released. And while it has been downplayed locally, this paper provides an important glimpse into this debate. Fluoride crosses the placenta and the blood-brain barrier, and a large range of studies provide weight that fluoride exposures lower IQ. What is occurring is an increasing weight of evidence that suggests neurodevelopmental harm. These studies, this body of evidence, can't be easily dismissed. And that is the core piece of evidence that opponents of fluoride want councils to know that the United States National Toxicology Program, a government program run by the US Department of Health and Human Services, has put out a report that overwhelmingly shows a relationship between fluoride and the lowering of IQ in children, and in particular, children under seven years of age. So I'm just looking at the National Toxicology program, the 2022 September report now in the abstract on page 12. So you can see that they separated it out into cognitive or neurodevelopmental effects and then IQ. There were 72 studies that looked at IQ and of those studies, 19 of them were of high quality. And of those 18 reported an association between higher fluoride exposure and lower IQ in children. And those 18 studies were conducted across five different countries. So we can see that there is a weight of evidence suggesting that fluoride has a relationship with IQ. At the very least, we need to investigate this. And we know that babies and toddlers consume more by body weight than their parents. And they absorb more fluoride into their bones than adults. And we know that, for example, while older people may pass more through their urine, it seems that babies will absorb more. So we have to be very cognizant of these different sort of exposure levels at that very young age. So the question we would have asked if our request to the Ministry of Health for an interview had been granted would have been, has the Director General of Health taken the US government's NTP report into consideration when ordering councils to fluoridate New Zealand's water supplies. But we weren't granted an interview, so instead we go looking for that answer in the Chief Science Advisor's report that Ashley Bloomfield used in making his decision. And that states that the first draft of the NTP report from 2019 was looked at, and that the draft concludes that fluoride is presumed to be a cognitive neurodevelopmental hazard in concentrations of more than 1.5 milligrams per litre. And that conclusion also finds its way into a graphic on page 35. So the good news is we do know that the toxicity effects of the NTP report are being considered. But at the same time, despite this, the Chief Science Advisor's report also downplays the findings by citing the Gluckman and Skegg Royal Society report from 2014, a whole five years prior to the NTP report, stating that while there is some evidence that high fluoride concentrations may have an adverse effect on developing brains, there is no convincing evidence of neurological effects at fluoride concentrations achieved by fluoridation of water supplies in New Zealand. Which means to say the NTP report hasn't changed anything. The chief science advisor believes that at 0.7 to 1 milligram per litre, our fluoride level does not reach the potential danger threshold of 1.5 milligrams per litre. And therefore the belief is, it is safe. But opponents to fluoride like Kane Titchener, a long-time fluoride-free New Zealand spokesperson and Te Aumuru community board member, say that any level of fluoride in our water is anything but safe. Yeah, it's a really polarising issue. So the key problem, the most concerning issue is the neurotoxicity research which was emerging. So we've got the situation where the science is clearly now showing that fluoride in the water is lowering children's IQ. The other issue is that it's being ignored or obfuscated by the Ministry of Health. So the National Toxicology Program, what they show is that at 52 or 55 human IQ studies show a lowering of IQ, the average of which is seven IQ points. 
the top science is the Canadian and Mexican cohort data, and they sh that, that science show at one part per million there's a five IQ point reduction. So in New Zealand right now, at 0.7 parts per million to one part per million, we're lowering children's IQ between three to five IQ points on average. Okay, but in response to that, the reports that I've read suggest that authorities would say that the levels of fluoride in those studies are different to New Zealand. Yeah, the Canadian study was actually done at 0.6 parts per million, so it is not valid to say that these studies are irrelevant. We fluoride at 0.7 to one part per million with an average of 0.85 as the target. The only study they rely on is the Broadbent study in terms of IQ, and they would consider that research to be of a relatively high quality study from the Dunedin Longitudinal Data. This was completed by Jonathan Broadbent, who is a well-known promoter of fluoridation. There are a number of issues with that research, and the NTP have identified those concerns and classified the Broadbent study as a low quality study. Okay, but they'd also say that they've addressed the IQ problem in the Chief Science Advisor report by quoting the 2014 Royal Society report that concludes that any lowering of IQ is of no real functional significance. So this is the gluckman skeg report which was released in 2014. It talks about um, the health concerns around fluoridation and that report found that there was really no um, concerns with fluoridation in terms of harms. But this critique of that 2014 review which is on fluoridefree.org.nz shows that there are major concerns with that report. So the main concern we've got and when they published the report, they said that there was a one IQ point reduction, which is not of functional significance. Now, when we alerted them of this error, because the reduction was actually a seven IQ point reduction based on the 2012 Harvard review, they amended the report to say that the reduction of one standard deviation was of no functional significance. So to clarify, they accepted your input and they changed that line from one IQ point to say one standard deviation. That's right. They changed. That's exactly what they've done. And how many IQ points is one standard deviation? One standard deviation is 15 IQ points. But what they're referring to is the seven IQ points from the Harvard review. So they were trying to conflate one IQ point with one standard deviation, which in this case is actually seven IQ points. Yeah, that, that's correct. So in my, I would consider that to be a complete cover up of the evidence. What does that look like for society? Seven IQ points across our population. Yeah, so if we look at um, the previous example, which is lead lowering children's IQ by 4.25 IQ points, at five IQ points, we see a, we see a shift across to the left, where we see a halving of the number of geniuses in our society and an increase of those mentally challenged by 50%. So it's a, it's a huge impact on society, and this is happening in New Zealand right now. So for example, fluoridation started in Auckland in 1966. Auckland has seen three generations of this lowering of IQ. So is this a similar situation to what happened with lead? Is it fair to compare those two? We can absolutely compare the two. So we're aware that lead was lowering um, IQ in the late 70s, early 80s, and that was pretty clear evidence that was coming out. Now, the Ministry of Health defended lead right up until 1996 when they decided to, yes, we should probably take lead out of leaded paint and leaded petrol. Now, it took a further 20 years for a paper, Rubin 2017, which showed that lead was lowering um, IQ across the population by 4.25 IQ points. So it takes a considerable amount of time to change these orthodoxies. So what do you think history will say about fluoride? How toxic is it? Oh, this is highly toxic. So this substance can't be released into the, the, the rivers, um, lakes and, and sea. It's, it's that toxic. Uh, they're wearing hazmat suits and they've got safety equipment and showers right next to where they put it in because they can't stand one second of this going on their skin or else it's going to burn them. This is how toxic. What's in it? 
Well, it's got, it's also hydrophorosilicic acid, but it's also got trace elements of lead, mercury, aluminium, and sometimes uranium. It's unbelievable. And we're putting it in our drinking water. We're putting it in the drinking water and it's completely validated. And so that's another place I would have loved to have stopped and had a comment from the Ministry of Health to ask, knowing that there is evidence of fluoride affecting IQ development, what's the benefit that is supposed to outweigh the risk of fluoride? But we weren't granted an interview, so instead we go back to the Chief Science Advisor's report, where it states that the argument for fluoride goes like this that dental caries remain the most prevalent chronic disease in New Zealand, affecting all people of all ages, and that the cause of dental caries occurs when bacteria present in the mouth feeds on sugary food and attacks the protective layers of our teeth, but that fluoride can help strengthen teeth and prevent dental caries by bonding with the enamel of your teeth. The greatest effect of fluoride in reducing tooth decay, the report says, comes from ongoing topical exposure, that's on the outside of the teeth, by brushing. But it also claims that the benefits are maximized if there is also system exposure while the teeth are forming. Which means to say there is a belief that by children drinking fluoridated water, fluoride strengthens teeth while they're being formed. And according to the chief science advisor, the worst side effect that can happen at the levels we fluoridate our water is that excessive fluoride intake can cause dental fluorosis which is a discolouring of the teeth. However, at the levels used here, this is generally mild. Furthermore, according to the Ministry of Health's website, an independent report claims that it found in fluoridated areas, there was a 40% lower lifetime incidence of tooth decay among children and adolescents, and concludes that a large body of epidemiological evidence over 60 years confirms water fluoridation prevents and reduces dental decay across the lifespan, and that because of the increased amount of dental decay among Māori and those who are most deprived, we expect those groups to have a greater absolute benefit from water fluoridation. How important was it for you to issue this order in your last week in this role? Well, uh, I've actually been a, a long-time champion of fluoridation. Uh, it's, a, it's an incredibly effective, one of the most cost-effective public health interventions. Uh, and one of the things about it is it's a great way to address inequities in um, outcomes, and particularly amongst children. However, there's a problem with all of this, that those statements don't actually appear to be backed up by the statistics that Bloomfield's decision was quoting, namely the health statistics available on the Ministry of Health's website. Because when we went there looking for oral health statistics on five-year-olds to visualize the claims of fluoride's effectiveness in the under seven age group that are most affected by the findings of the NTP report, amongst five-year-olds, when looking at the incidence of decayed, missing and filled teeth, non-fluoridated areas did look bad in the early 2000s, However, since then, there hasn't been much difference between fluoridated and non-fluoridated areas. And actually, since 2019, there is more decayed, missing and filled teeth in fluoridated areas of the country. And that's not an anomaly. The same can be seen in data collected for the percentage of New Zealand five-year-olds without dental caries. Since about 2007, the data has converged, and in this graph, where the higher number means less cavities, there is barely any difference between fluoridated and unfluoridated areas today. And if you're still not convinced, when you drill down even further to compare fluoridated Auckland versus unfluoridated Canterbury, again, this graph shows that the higher number means less cavities, and it also turns out that unfluoridated Canterbury is actually doing better. But while we accept that graphs can show anything, and perhaps these ones might even be refuted easily, what they do show is that there is not 40% less tooth decay in fluoridated areas. So that begs the big question, what is fluoride actually doing? And according to Dr. Neil Waddell, a former dental council member, and Dr. Denham Crone, a former head of the Auckland Ambulance Service, they say that the theory of fluoride helping teeth is old science that has been overtaken by evidence that fluoride is actually more dangerous than previously thought. The theory is that fluoride will strengthen, i.e. harden the teeth and reduce tooth decay. 
originally they believed that the process was by ingesting the fluoride that when the teeth formed from the inside to the outside, it would make the enamel harder. That has subsequently been disproved. There's this extraordinary idea that if you swallow fluoride, it goes into your tummy, it comes up and it goes just into your teeth. Whereas in fact, 25 years ago, the dental research community was saying, actually, no, we got it wrong. They decided, actually, it's topical. It's purely on the surface of the teeth and the mouth. That's where it works. So coming back to, to how toxic is it, they say that it's, it's so minuscule that it has no effect. It's a bit like saying, well, smoking over 40 years has got no effect. It's a, an accumulative effect. Because what you then see, and in New Zealand, about 40% of the children, by the time they reach school age, show signs of fluoride poisoning in what they call fluorosis. It has caused a discoloration. They say, oh, it's just cosmetic. But the fact is the body is showing signs of excess fluoride by having fluorosis forming. 40% of the children in fluoridated areas have got fluorosis. In New Zealand, most, about 90% of the fluoridated water comes through a process where the fertilizer industry have a byproduct that is toxic. And in order to get rid of that, they put it through what they call gas scrubbers. And that liquid is collected and it's known as hydrofluorosilicic acid. That now is highly corrosive. It's got to be kept in plastic lined tanks. The people who are handling this have got to have complete protection. If the area in which they're operating is closed, they must wear a respirator. And so it's transferred into a tank and from there it's then dosed into the water. So there's a whole body of literature out there talking about concerns uh, and harms that you may be doing to people by Tipping, tipping what people would say is a poison into the town reservoir in a very cavalier way. It has been so, in an Alice in Wonderland world, it has been so turned around that the council now pays to buy a toxic industrial waste and tip it into our most precious of things, our drinking water. And so now it's clear, this is a topic that has two sides. And even if you're not convinced by the NTP data, at the very least it has opened up the idea that we should at least be having a discussion about it. However, according to those orders that Ashley Bloomfield announced on his last day of work in July 2022, there is no room for consultation. The Health Amendment Act now says that it's the Director General's decision alone and the councils who are expected to do the fluoridation are not required to consult with their communities. And according to Andy Wickers, a councillor for Western Bay of Plenty, and Robert Lee, a councillor from Rotorua, two city councillors who've been tasked with implementing Bloomfield's orders, that opens up massive legal implications, the biggest of which is the subject of our Bill of Rights and our right to refuse medical treatment, or in a more positive way of saying it, our right to choose how we are being medicated. What do the public say? Do they want fluoride? We don't know, we haven't asked them. It, in the past, it's been an issue that has given rise to a great deal of community engagement. It's a, it's a hot topic. But under this new Health Act and the, the amendments that were made in 2021, we, it says we don't have to consult. That said, the Local Government Act says we do have to consult whenever we do anything significant. And we have to consult with the people who are affected. So in my view, under the Local Government Act, the Rotorua Council and all the other councils are obliged to consult with the public as to whether they think this is a right and proper thing to do. But if you put that aside, it still comes down to informed consent, that Nuremberg principle that we should have the right to refuse medical treatment unless there's a really good reason not to. And there's, I see no really good reason not to. Nobody is at present dying from a lack of fluoride in water. So it's, I would think it's quite hard to justify the breach of a right that came from Nuremberg to give us sovereignty over our own bodies to, to justify that for no obvious significant payback. We do have a choice to oppose it, um, but it's not likely that we will um, because of the implications of uh, not 
complying with it is um, significant fines that potentially could make its way down to the individual councillors. Yes, we're subject to a $200,000 fine or a fine up to $200,000 and up to $10,000 a day if we don't fluoridate. So my problem with it is that the information that I've been provided by other sources around the, um, the safety and efficacy of, of uh, fluoridating, sort of the ethical implications of medicating people without their consent, raises enough questions in my mind that the information provided or the platform on which the Ministry of Health have made their decision appears to be narrow and quite selective in the information that they have used to justify their position. I would prefer it as a referendum where people, the people who are actually going to be affected by this have the chance to say whether they want it or not. I would say that the amendment made in 2021 tried to ensure there would be no debate. It's bad law that is designed to circumvent democracy. It's, um, there's no democratic accountability for the decision maker who chose or directed that we must fluoridate. Under the Local Government Act, we are required to consult on any significant matter that affects anybody. We don't live in a dictatorship. The central government uh, has certain powers, but those powers have the oversight of the High Court, for example. And uh, so their direction is subject to a review by the courts. And that statement was almost prophetic because not long after, on Friday the 10th of November, 2023, one year and four months after the initial announcement by Ashley Bloomfield, the High Court did indeed review it. As part of a case brought by a group called New Health New Zealand, who are fighting the fluoridation of our water. And the High Court found that Ashley Bloomfield's order was in fact unlawful, because he didn't take into account the New Zealand Bill of Rights, in particular Section 11, our right to refuse medical treatment, and Section 5, under which he was supposed to demonstrably show why a breach of Section 11 was justified. A blow for the Ministry of Health, with former Director General of Health Ashley Bloomfield's fluoridation orders ruled unlawful by the High Court. It means the orders could be set aside or returned to the Ministry of Health for reconsideration before a hearing on the broader issue next year. And so now we end up back where we started, in council chambers that would usually be empty of spectators, but now are filled with supporters of those who are making presentations against fluoridation of our water supplies. Madam Chair, members of council, the purpose of my presentation today is to assist you all with a better understanding regarding the hazardous toxic substance fluoridation and the implication of it in being in our Rotorua waters, particularly with the high probabilities of harm to humans, harm to the district water infrastructure and substantial environmental harms. But also today, in light of the new health ruling, it's also the day that Councillor Lee wants to know if the Rotorua Lakes Council is going to continue with its fluoridation plans, a decision that no doubt will echo its way around New Zealand. Madam Chair, you'll uh, recall back in August when we considered the fluoridation matter, I brought to the Council's attention that uh, there was a legal challenge underway by New Health New Zealand against the Director General of Health and in particular his uh, directives to the 14 councils including Rotorua to Florida. As you may be aware, uh, the court has declared the directives illegal. So my question is, does council intend to continue to implement an illegal directive? Well, they are interim C response. Yes, the Council is aware of the High Court decision um, for the time being, until we get clarification on our legal position, uh, the organisation has uh, decided to pause work on bringing back a tender to this table so that you have clarity on what the legal position is before we proceed. Thank you. So now we're at an impasse that can only be broken by a legal battle. And on one side, we have a health authority that tells us fluoride is effective and safe. 
and they have the studies to prove it. While on the other side, we have opponents who say they have the studies to prove it's not. And stuck in the middle are the councils who are footing the bill, whatever the outcome. But if we're going to finish this story on something that we can all agree on, it's this. That there is a dental decay problem in New Zealand. And in particular, it's Māori and Pacifica children who are outrageously overrepresented. In fact, according to the Ministry of Health's data dump, on average since 2005, regardless of fluoridation status, only 37% of Māori children live without dental caries. And only 33% of Pacifica children can say the same. While for other ethnicities, that number is 67%. And that's not just a massive chasm, that's a massive failure for our health system that fluoride doesn't explain. So if fluoride in the water is not the answer, what is? According to Dr. Denham Crone, we've got to start looking towards sugar, the traditional Māori diet and Scotland. To me it's quite clear that sugar is the issue. It's quite clear. I mean, when people hear Pacifica and Māori, they probably think, oh, well, maybe there's something in their genetics that makes them more prone to dental caries. And to this, I would say, there was a, an American dentist, Weston Price, came to New Zealand in 1930. This dentist was very interested in if he could find people around the world in the 1930s who were still eating their, what he called, ancestral diet. What were their teeth and their bones and their body like? He went up to Rotorua and looked at kids who were eating, Maori kids who were eating white man's food. They were eating sugar, they were eating white flour. Uh, and he was also taken up to Mahia Peninsula and he said it was so clear that those people, the Maori that were eating traditional foods, just had beautiful teeth. And he was also um, shown uh, pre-European Maori skulls in, in museum. And he was staggered. He said that in 2002 teeth, there was one cavity. It's all, we are eating more than a hundred times as much sugar as when Captain Cook arrived and sailed into New Zealand. So sugar is the issue? I think it's the issue, but not just me. If you read the WHO, the WHO are absolutely insistent that it is sugar is the issue that rots children's teeth. And so, you know, uh, don't take it from me, go and read the WHO. Okay, so if fluoride's not the solution, then what is? So Fluoride Free New Zealand for a number of years have been promoting the Scotland Child Smile Programme. And this is a programme that talks about um, educating about healthy food, reducing sugar. Um, it talks about educating the children, but also the parents. Um, it looks at a more a regular toothbrushing program within the schools and a regular checkups in a more thorough way. So sort of so after lunch there'll be a supervised um, toothbrushing program where the student the children are brushing their teeth and they are doing that on a regular basis. So it's an everyday thing. It's an everyday thing. So, yeah. So they get into a habit of doing it. Yeah. If you want to reduce caries in children, it's so simple. Good oral hygiene, brush your teeth and remove the sugars or reduce the sugars. And if you do that, you will have a decrease in caries. There is no need to fluoridate the water. If you want to, as a general population, introduce toothbrushing in schools, uh, Scotland have got a programme that does that and it's been highly successful. You see this rapid drop of dental decay and all of the positive effects of that. And Scotland doesn't fluoridate. So they are achieving better results without fluoride, just by simply brushing teeth in schools, than we achieve uh, in New Zealand. And if you look at the New Zealand stats, children from fluoridated areas uh, have got the same level of decay as children from unfluoridated areas. The key factor is what is the dental hygiene like? That's the solution to the problem in terms of tooth decay. And the way to solve the, the, the fluoride problem in terms of our body systems is take it out of the water. Don't put this toxic byproduct from the fertiliser industry into our drinking water. And so now we wait for the High Court ruling in the New Health New Zealand case, which is due in February 2024, and for its decision that on the face of it will either tear down our Bill of Rights or enshrine them forever in the thoughts of our lawmakers. But this isn't actually a story that will be defined simply by a court case or its outcome. 
Rather, fundamentally, this is a story about choice and our right in a free and democratic nation to freely discuss and decide as a community rather than be dictated to by laws that stop all discussion. The National Toxicology Report detailing the dangers to IQ from fluoride is not some conspiracy theorist document. It's a United States government report that sets out the research of scientists from all over the world. So why aren't the government entering into a discussion about it? Perhaps there hasn't been evidence in the past of fluoride's dangers, but there is now. And so too, there is no shame in admitting that, then reassessing it. Especially since we're talking about a highly toxic substance and toothbrushing programs have been shown to work elsewhere. And then there's the biggest question of all, that many of us are thinking, but few are asking out loud. What has happened to democracy in this country? when our government begins passing laws that say we, the community, no longer need to be consulted. My name is Alastair Harding, and this has been an In Focus report for Reality Check Radio.